Let us say together the hospitality blessing down on this pew card right in front of you. Holy Spirit, living within us, guide our hearts and minds as we welcome today all of us who worship with us as a promise. Give us discerning hearts so that everyone who crosses our threshold feels welcome with the Spirit and the blood. Help us to recognize each person as an individual sent out by you, who will enrich our lives. And most of all,
Almighty God, the foundation of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthily our unworthiness we dare not, and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. A reading from the book of Amos. This is what the Lord showed me, a basket of summer fruit. He said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, says the Lord God. The dead bodies shall be many, cast out in every place. Be silent. Hear this, ye that trample on the needy, and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over, so that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath, so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shepherd great, and practice deceit without false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sw sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account, and everyone mourn who lives in it? and all that rise like the Nile, and be tossed about, and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon, and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on all loins, and baldness on every head, I will make it like the morning for an only son, and the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to east, they shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm aside for today is Psalm 52. We will pray this responsibly by whole verse. You tyrant, why do you boast of wickedness against the God of all day long? You thought of ruin. Your retirement is like a sharp embrace. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking the truth. You love all words that hurt, but what do you see all time? Oh, that God would demolish you utterly, topple you, and snatch you from your dwelling, and root you out of the land of the living. Rise, shall see the and they shall die and be saved. This is the one who did not take God for a refuge, but trusted in great wealth and relied upon wickedness. I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will give you thanks for what you have done and declare the goodness of your name in the presence of the God. A reading from Paul's letter to the Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, 
things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile himself. All things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. Provided that you continue, securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became a servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Gospel of the Lord. In a prayer book for Australia, that's the prayer that goes with today's readings. It presents God in the person of Christ as the guest in our midst. Yes, Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Yes, in him all things in heaven and on earth were created. And yes, all things are held together in him and through him. God was pleased to reconcile God himself to all things. This grand cosmic image of Christ presented by Paul in his letters to the Colossians stretches from the beginning of creation all the way to the end of the ages. Paul begins his letter with this image of Jesus akin to the images of the universe we got from the James Webb Space Telescope this week. Just as the view through the lens of that telescope makes the universe come alive to us in a different way, by showing us what we couldn't see before, seeing Jesus through Paul's eyes encourages us to look up and around and notice the connections we couldn't see before. During the pandemic, churches worked hard to make online worship possible because that was one of the major ways we could stay connected as a community. Praying together, seeing one another's comments on Facebook, camping for a mission trip in Dave and Susan Saxon's backyard, all of that helped drive home. The idea that God is all around us, that we can encounter God and do and be church no matter where we are. After all, that was the way early Christians worshipped, in small groups, in people's homes, focused just as much on right practices as they were on right beliefs. Now that we are, knock on wood, emerging from the pandemic, church leaders like me find ourselves emphasizing the importance of being here at church on top of this hill on Sunday mornings. Most of the week I'm over there in the PLC by myself, and I pray that over time this hill will be alive with activity during the week too. To be clear, this isn't about inflating our average Sunday attendance, a number often to judge, used to judge the health and vitality of the church. This isn't about finding people to keep me company during the week. This is about seeing connections and making connections and strengthening connections. When we look around us with the awareness that all things are held together in Christ and through Christ, God was pleased to reconcile God's self to all things. We remember that being Christian is not only about our personal relationship with God, our personal connection to Jesus. Through Jesus, we have a relationship with all of creation, visible and invisible. Jesus is the head of the body of the church, and through Jesus, each of us is part of the body of Christ. And we are called to love one another as Christ loved us. Each as a member of this body, each of us has a spiritual gift to share, each of us has a role, and we honor one another's gifts. For without them, we would not, could not be whole. 
Therefore, I'm excited for us to kick off everything we're doing off the hill. I hope we can strengthen existing partnerships with Refugee Services of Texas and Menchaca Elementary School. I also hope to create new partnerships. So if you're sitting there and thinking, I wonder if people at St. Albans might, or I wonder if St. Albans can work with, please, please, please share those thoughts with me with one of your best dream members. And the meet and greets we did my first month here also to help drive home how fun and how vital it is for people to meet in small groups. I'm also very excited for this hill to come alive. So tempted to make a sound music reference, but I'll stop. <laughs> Some churches host 12 step groups or make space for an artist in residence. We're not in the business of renting out space, but we do want to support groups whose mission and purpose are in line with ours. St. Albans will have, its, have to find its own way to be part of the connections that are already here and the potential connections that are springing up all around us. I'm also looking forward to talking about what it means to delve more deeply into our faith, particularly what we believe and what it means for us to believe in all those things. Using the Mobius strip analogy from last week, what happens on the hill feeds into what happens off the hill. And what happens off the hill feeds into what happens on the hill. There are not two sides, there is just one. Strengthening one requires strengthening the other. And looking through the eyes of Paul helps us to see that truth. This takes us to today's gospel, back to where I started the sermon, with Christ as the guest in our midst. But before I continue, I want to take a poll. Raise your hand if you see yourself in Martha. Raise your hand if you see yourself in Mary. Raise your hand if you can't decide. <laughs> so just to be fair, I'll tell you my answer. I have always seen myself in Martha. As a type A older sibling, I have always had a soft spot for her sense of responsibility and for her resentment of a younger sibling who seems to do no wrong and can just coast along. <laughs> <laughs> As an Enneagram 2 with a strong one way, I'm a helper who has a strong sense of what's fair and right. I'm all about proactively meeting the needs I perceive, and I get frustrated when I think other people aren't doing their part. So as you might imagine, I get really defensive of Martha whenever I read the story. Historically, the images of Martha doing the work and Mary sitting at Jesus' feet have been used to contrast a life of action against a life of contemplation, with the better part being a life of contemplation. I get so protective of Martha, I end up buying into that false binary. When I'm drawn into that debate, I lose sight of what this story is about. And before I continue, I want to make it clear. When it comes to the life of study and the life of practice, the life of contemplation and the life of action, separating them creates a false dichotomy. There aren't two sides. There is just one. Back to Jesus' guest. The image of the invisible God has come among us. The firstborn of all creation is sitting in the living room. When Martha saw Jesus as guest, she saw him through the eyes of an ancient Middle Eastern host. She had invited him into her house. He was her guest. Growing up in her particular cultural context, the mental checklist for how hosts were supposed to offer hospitality to their guests was ingrained in her mind. Once he walked through the door, her body probably started moving automatically around the house to check off each item on the list. When Mary saw Jesus as guest, she saw a guest unlike any other guest. This isn't just because she wasn't technically the host, though given her position as the younger sister, she probably should have helped. But when Jesus is guest, 
hospitality looks different. As opening prayer reminds us, welcoming Jesus looks like being alert to his presence and being attentive to his voice. Don't get me wrong, Jesus would have appreciated something to drink and something to eat, but he wasn't there for food and drink. Jesus is no ordinary guest. We welcome Jesus into our lives and our homes, not just because he can teach us how to live a good and moral life. We follow Jesus because he is the firstborn of all creation, and because it is through him that we are reconciled to God and to all things, whether on earth or in heaven. These days, it's hard enough to be reconciled to other people in the same school district and the same state. How can we, how can we be reconciled to all the things? As Jesus told Martha, there is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. We start with the only thing we need, Jesus. This is the better part that will not be taken away from us. As long as we, as long as we remain alert to his presence and attuned to his words. As I learned in the practice of centering prayer, every time I turn away, it is not a failure on my part, but a gift from God, because turning away gives me the opportunity to turn back. We find a way to focus on the one thing here, in our corner of creation in South Austin. A church is different. It's not just another philanthropic or social or charitable organization. Because our eyes are on the cross, our eyes are on Jesus. Because we are alert to the presence of Jesus, we strengthen connections we have made and look for places to create connections we have yet to make. Because we are attentive to the words of Jesus, we know that we aren't following him for our own benefit. And we aren't following him because it makes us comfortable, but because he will challenge us to see and do things differently the way he did Martha. And I'd like to think he encouraged Mary to help out a little more, bit more around the house, too. Jesus is our one thing. Therefore, we turn to the words of God over and over so that we might have new eyes to see what we haven't seen before. To look at the world and see what God is calling us to do and to be. Jesus is our one thing, so we come to this table not just for solace, but for strength. Not just for pardon, but for renewal. And may the grace of this holy communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we must worthily serve the world in the same. Amen. Amen. And now let us refer our faith with the ancient words of the Nicene Creed on um, page 358. We believe in one God.
the prayers of the people for the poor can be found on page 388 in the Book of Common Prayer, or on page 3. <clears throat> Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use it, its resources rightly in the service of others. And to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Stand your kneeling, let us confess our sins against God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, we thought word in thee, how we have done, and how we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry.
So a couple of instructions for communion. If you're coming up and getting a regular wafer, hold your hands out like this. If you would like a gluten-free wafer, cover your hand like this. Um, and if you'd like to come up for a blessing, just cross your arms and I'll give you a blessing. And so now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice.
Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood, you reconcile us. By his wounds, we are healed. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. We celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of Sarah and Hagar, Rachel and Rebecca and Leah, God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this holy communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest. To whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
Danny O'Neill, let us pray together in the first communion prayer. Thank you. 